Great. So hello and welcome to another curatorial conversation at the Warburg Institute. I'm Bill Sherman, the Institute's director. And many of you will know that we started this series a few years ago uh, in order to give people a closer look at current exhibitions and other important projects involving the display of collections. Of course, there aren't very many current uh, exhibitions and the uh, behind the scenes glimpses of things that we are not able to visit is probably more important uh, than ever in this last year. Now, from almost any perspective you might want to use to approach it, this project that we're featuring uh, today is about as important as it gets. And since this historic exhibition of the so-called Torlonia Marbles has been closed several times due to COVID-19 and when open, subject to very strict restrictions, and because it was supposed to finish next week, we figured that we uh, had to get in there now uh, with this event uh, as possibly for most of us, the only way to see this extraordinary reconstruction. So I'm happy to report uh, via Salvatore that the run has now been extended again until January 9th. So if you are able to get to Rome between now and then, you'll have the opportunity to see the show. And I have no doubt that today's conversation will send you scrambling to book your tickets. The astonishing artistic quality of the works constituting the world's greatest private collection of ancient sculpture is reason enough to rush to Rome. But add to this the fact that the collection has been virtually impossible to see until now, and the fact that its display involved the architectural renovation of one of Italy's most important heritage sites. And you'll start to understand why this has been one of the most talked about exhibitions uh, in some time. Now, such a project, of course, demanded a large uh, amount of work by a large team. And we're very lucky to have uh, two of the uh, team members here today to give us a behind the scenes virtual tour, uh, Salvatore Settis and David Chipperfield. Now, both, as you'll know, are absolute masters in their fields of the representation of the past, both famous for their decades of work at the intersection of objects buildings and institutions. They really need no introduction to the people who are attending this seminar, but that shouldn't stop me from saying just a little bit about why their collaboration on this project is so special. Salvatore Settis, of course, co-curator of the exhibition, is an archeologist and art historian known for a number of things, institutional leadership as director of Getty Research Institute and Scuola Normale Superiore in Pisa, uh, also for his innovative exhibition making. And uh, finally, last but not least, for his many books. Um, here at the Warburg Institute, we think of him as one of our longstanding friends and as one of the great experts on its founder, A.B. Barbo. David Chipperfield, the show's designer, is of course one of the world's most celebrated architects and David's practice was founded in the 1980s with much of the best known work being for museums and libraries, intimate uh, work on collections from the beginning, uh, including of course, several of the most sensitive projects on Berlin's Museum Island, and recently the complete renovation and extension of the Royal Academy here in London. So we are very grateful to you, David and Salvatore for joining us uh, here today. Uh, each of them is going to give a short introduction, uh, about 15 minutes with some images to help us see uh, what went into the making of the exhibition and what it actually looks like in its uh, realized form. Uh, we'll then have a little bit of time for some conversation, some questions uh, from me, and then there will be plenty of time, I think, for some Q&A with all of you who have joined uh, for this exciting tour. And without further ado, I will hand over to Salvatore Settis, who will set the scene and tell us a little bit about the origins of this uh, amazing exhibition. Salvatore, over to you. Thank you very much, Bill, for inviting us today. It's a very uh, uh, important opportunity for me to speak about this exhibition in the same 
uh, framework in which also David Chipperfield, with whom we worked at this exhibition for uh, a few years. Uh, so I, 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 I hope we can give you an idea of the complexity, but also of the results we were able to achieve. As, uh, as, as Bill mentioned, the, the Torlonia uh, collection is the largest collection, the largest private collection of classical sculpture in uh, uh, worldwide. And it, it was collected in what was called the Museo Torlonia, a large museum in uh, Trastevere in Rome, which was open uh, uh, from uh, uh, 1875 through the early 40s. Uh, and then uh, the collection for very complex reasons became basically invisible. Uh, now, a, an institutional agreement between the Fondazione Torlonia, representing the family, the Torlonia family, and the Ministry of Culture uh, should lead to a reopening of the Torlonia Museum in Rome, somewhere else, not in the same place, but somewhere else. And uh, the, 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 the collection of the, of the um, museum includes something like 620 pieces in the exhibition. We uh, could uh, show only 92 of them, but the exhibition was meant as a uh, first step towards the reopening of the Museo Torlonia. Now let me walk you through the exhibition with a PowerPoint. Let me make sure that uh, the screen, my screen is visible, is it? Yes, it looks good, Salvatore. Thank okay. you. So this is uh, the, 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 the opening um, slide with the date. Uh, unfortunately, the, 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 the exhibition has been extended until January 9th. 2022. Now, the problem was how to move from a, a museum with a, a museum, no longer a no longer visible museum with 620 statues, which are preserved in, uh, a, in, in large storage rooms to an exhibition in a much smaller uh, space. How to choose uh, the pieces to be shown. Before this point, I, I want to give you a very quick idea of how rich and uh, diverse the, 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 the Torlonia collections are. One of the things that Prince Alessandro Torlonia, the first Prince Torlonia named Alessandro uh, uh, was able to buy is uh, one of the things is Villa Albani, the, the villa uh, uh, founded, created in, uh, in, in, in mid 17, uh, in, in mid 18th century by Cardinal Alessandro Albani with Winkelmann and others. So it was bought by, by the Tolonia family in 1866. And you see some uh, uh, things here and a few pieces we didn't pick anything from Villa Albani, which uh, uh, still belongs to the Torlonia family, but a few pieces from Villa Albani moved to the Torlonia Museum. And the Torlonia family had uh, another a number of, of, of other princely residences, including the old Palazzo Torlonia, no longer existing in uh, the area of Piazza Venezia, and, uh, uh, and other things you see in this slide. Uh, the last uh, introductory uh, slide I want to show you are a few photographs from the Torlonia Museum with some visitors at the end of 19th century. As mentioned, we needed a strong concept. What kind of concept could we have that could guide us in selecting in a limited number of pieces, about 90, 92 pieces, in order to uh, have a, uh, uh, a narrative of some sort representative of the museum, but also of a, uh, of a narrative valid in itself. We needed a strong concept 
and uh, this was uh, my job uh, with my co-curator Carlo Gasparri, a great uh, expert in uh, the um, in uh, in Greek and Roman art, and we also needed a strong and consistent design, and this is what uh, fortunately we were uh, lucky enough to have it from David Chipperfield, and he will talk about it much better than I could ever do. Which was the concept? As uh, explained in this slide, we decided to uh, um, use this opportunity to offer a cross section of early collecting of uh, classical sculpture first and of the transition, a very delicate uh, and, and complex uh, topic, the transition from private collecting to public collections, i.e. from, uh, from um, private collections to what we now call the museum, the museum as an institution. Uh, and this is something that we could do on the uh, capital in Rome much better than anywhere else. Uh, I, will, I, will, I, I, I will now walk you through the exhibition, the different, uh, the, the, the five sections showing only very generally what the, uh, the sections are. So we are going backwards in time. In the first section, which coincides with the first room, we have this, the only bronze, a large bronze Germanicus from the Torlonia collection, um, uh, which is uh, uh, saying hello to all the visitors at the very beginning. And we are also, uh, we, we, we put together a number of, uh, of, uh, of portrait busts of Roman emperor or empresses or other Persons, because the uh, the number of uh, um, uh, imperial portraits was one of the most famous things of the uh, of the Torlonia Museum. The color of the walls uh, in this room, in this particular room, reflects the original color of the every room in the Torlonia Museum in Trastevere, which uh, uh, had originally seven seventy seven rooms. And I, 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 David might talk about the colors of the other rooms. So this is another uh, glimpse at uh, this particular, at, at this uh, first room. In the second room, we are moving back in time from 1875 uh, foundation of, of the museum to the entire 19th century, when the Torlonia family uh, uh, made several excavations or occasional findings in their uh, extremely large family estate all around Rome. And a, a, a selection of those pieces, including uh, precious reliefs from uh, the Acropolis in Athens, transported from the Acropolis in Athens to Rome in uh, second century AD and found again uh, by, by the Torlonias or other pieces uh, that you can see also in this other uh, slide from the second room. This is the second section, 19th century. The third section cover covers the, uh, um, the, the 18th century. And the main sources in the 18th century uh, for the um, sculptures in the Torlonia Museum are Villa Albani. The pieces you look here come from actually from Villa Albani, but were moved uh, uh, to the Torlonia Museum in the 19th century itself or from the Cavaceppi collection. Cavaceppi was a great uh, restorer and sculptor and uh, the Torlonias basically bought his entire uh, collection once he died at the end of um, uh, 18th century. And the, uh, the Cavaceppi and, uh, and Al Albani collections were um, installed in this uh, exhibition in a way that could remind visitors of the uh, 18th century uh, taste. And this is again uh, part of the uh, Cavaceppi, uh, uh, of the Cavaceppi collection in the third section of the exhibition. 
Moving to the, uh, uh, the next section, section fourth. Section fourth, we are moving in, in the um, uh, 17th century. And uh, we, we are fortunate enough to have in uh, the um, Torlonia Museum, the Torlonia collection, a large portion, a large part of the uh, of one of, of the most refined, perhaps the most refined collection of classical sculpture in uh, 17th century Rome, that of uh, Vincenzo Giustiniani. Uh, uh, and we made a selection of the collection of Vincenzo Giustiniani, including extraordinary pieces such as the uh, goat you see on your right, whose head is uh, 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 a restoration was totally remade by Gian Lorenzo Bernini. So one of the many restorations we have selected, as I mentioned, the um, uh, history of collecting as the, the, the field rouge for this collection, but we might with this very same objects made uh, we, we, we could well have made another ex uh, exhibitions uh, about restoring, for instance. In the, uh, the, in the main room of the, uh, for the Giustiniani collection, we have further busts and, and portraits of Roman emperors and other uh, sculpture, uh, sculptures where we could also show uh, the difference in color, in, in, in colored marbles of different sorts. And also in the examples you see in this particular slides, we can, uh, we can show how Marcus Vincenzo Giustiniani was already very well aware that uh, the uh, uh, Roman uh, collectors had uh, the, the habit of making several copies after Greek originals. And Marcus uh, Giustiniani used to exhibit those copies, such as the two satis on, on the slide, uh, on, the, on the photo above, or the two uh, crouching Venuses uh, on, the, on, the, on, on, part, uh, on the inferior part of the slide. Uh, and he would uh, uh, put them on the, uh, at the two sides of, of, of a door, for instance, just to, um, to evidence the uh, seriality of, the, of their production. The third slide is the famous Hestia Justiniani, the only copy, um, Rom a Roman copy, but the only existing copy after a um, uh, early uh, 5th century BC Greek bronze. The last section is uh, about uh, uh, collecting in uh, collecting antiquities in Rome in the uh, 15th and 16th century and for instance uh, you see here uh, a uh, famous Torlonia uh, uh, or Chasey uh, vase uh, with a, a satyr and which is represented in um, a, a drawing by Martin van Heemskerk in the Garden of Cardinal Chase in 1533. And you can, uh, you, you can see here the same drawing. And, uh, the, and, and, the, and, the, uh, and this is a particularly interesting case because we, we know that uh, this uh, sculpted vase was in a Trastevere church in 15th century and then moved to a uh, garden of a cardinal, then to a garden of another cardinal, to a villa, and then to the Tolonia Museum. So we can, we can see uh, the, 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 the um, Tolonia Museum is so rich that we can also show pieces from different collections of different, from different private, from a, at least four different private collections uh, from between 15th and, and 14th century. Why? So this is the question, why? Uh, at some point after more than 1000 years in which the uh, ruins in Rome were full of statues and nobody would care for them. At some point in 15th century, the um, Romans started picking up 
those captured and bringing them in their homes and gardens and uh, uh, the, 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 the origin of this collecting was not for aesthetical or artistic reasons, but, but for political reasons. The Romans of that time, in order to create a counter power, uh, contrasting and balancing in some way the over uh, the, the overarching power of the popes, they started collecting privately uh, objects uh, for them. And the, the Torlonia collection uh, assembled a number of those pieces uh, which uh, moved from one collection to another. We are moving to the last uh, room of the collection where the uh, very sumptuous catalog uh, published in the 1880s is shown, the first catalog ever to show all the pieces of a single museum in photograph, in photographic reproduction. And the last piece from the Torlonia collection we show in the exhibition itself is this uh, Hercules made up of, of 112 fragments. And in this case, we left the fragments very easily recognizable. This uh, statue is made up of fragments from two different but identical statues, two copies after the same original, plus a number of uh, pieces of restoration just to um, deconstruct, let me put it this way, the way how the, uh, the, uh, the taste in, in, uh, in uh, 17th century, for instance, uh, would uh, um, uh, treat, would address the conservation of uh, uh, an ancient statue. Finally, once the exhibition is finished, we move, and this is this is not part of the exhibition, this is not part of the Torlonia collection, but it is connected with the exhibition. We move to one of the most precious rooms of the Capitoline Museums in Rome, where for this opportunity, the direction of the Capitol Museums assembled for the first time after many centuries, all the bronzes given by Pope Sixtus IV to the Roman people. And uh, in, in 1471, with a reproduction of the uh, inscription, uh, which says that uh, Sixtus IV, in his immense benevolence, decided to return and assign in perpetuity this outstanding bronze status, a perennial testimony of excellence and merit to the Roman people from whose midst they arose. So in this case, we see that as a response, as a political response to a political um, habit of collecting, the Pope created the first nucleus of what a few centuries later would become the first public museum in the world, the Capitol Museum founded by another pope, uh, Clemens the Twelfth, um, uh, in uh, 1735. So this is the real end of the exhibition within the uh, Capitol Museums, and I think that uh, my very short walk through the museum can end here. That's fantastic, Salvatore. Thank you very much, and congratulations to you and your fellow curators. And now we can move over to David. Um, if you stop yeah. uh, sharing at the top, there we go. Um, that's fantastic. And uh, can David, you hear me? Can you yeah. Okay, this our slides. <clears throat> Yeah, um, it's, it's not a very enviable uh, position to follow Salvatore Sertis <coughs> in any <laughs> such event as this. Um, and uh, those of you that don't know him uh, should be um, reassured that he's not talking as enthusiastically uh, tonight just because he's giving a lecture. He always talks so enthusiastically about his subject. and. This was not only a great treat to um, be in his, for our team to learn from him and uh, his colleague, Carlo Gaspar, Gaspari, but um, his dynamic and his energy was sufficient even to push against the inertia of Italian uh, administration. So I want to, <coughs> to 
to thank Salvatore for everything he taught us and what a wonderful journey it was for us, but also in uh, admiration to know that in a way, enthusiasm, uh, knowledge uh, and intelligence can, can win over. And uh, this was another great lesson amongst the other more academic and intellectual lessons that Salvatore taught us on this wonderful journey. So I'm gonna show, I, I mean, there will be some repetition here. I'm really sorry about that, but I will try and talk about it obviously from the point of view of our own position. Here's an image, a um, 19th century image of visitors to the Tolonium uh, Museum. And <clears throat> you can see here that the, the objects are placed on blocks. Uh, the exponents are placed on blocks and there's a certain uh, quietness about this, which uh, we rather liked. <clears throat> and we, I will talk a little bit about the issue of display and the, and the relationship between, in a way, architectural space and the object and the, 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 the framing or the positioning of objects, either by bases or, or, or any other devices. Next slide, please. So this is the Villa Caparelli. Uh, which became, so this is the other actor, if you like, but one of the, the we, we inherited two, two physical things. One was the, was the villa and the other is the collection. Uh, the villa has a, its own complex history. Um, uh, it was badly damaged after what it had been the uh, residence of the German ambassador, I think. Um, and Mussolini uh, reoccupied it because he was irritated that the Germans should have such a prominent building. Um, and uh, it, uh, when we inherited it, it's in a very poor condition. And so one of the things we had to do was to think about how we uh, installed it in there. Although, again, during the process of this, the, um, the administration uh, cleaned up the spaces and made a sort of shell in, within which we could exhibit. Next slides, please. And I think this is showing the sort of um, uh, exhibition uh, shell conditions which, which uh, were undertaken before we moved in. And it puts, sorry, can you just go back one? Um, in this condition, it's, it's stranded between its, uh, archi its original architectural character, which was a villa, and the, the other condition which it has, which is that it stands on the foundations of the Temple of Yoke, which was the biggest temple of, the, of Rome. Next, please. So one actor is the building, the other actor obviously uh, is the collection itself. And Salvatore has talked to you about that from, from an intellectual point of view. And I, I'm not going to uh, add much to that. Uh, the only thing I can say is that we had another issue in a way, which was um, the classification of objects by typologies and sizes. You know, there's a very different issue about uh, heads that might be on a shelf uh, figures that might be standing uh, uh, and basins that need uh, another way of exhibiting. Things which can be seen flat on, things which need to be seen in the round. So these were, this was an analysis that we were interested in. And of course, there were a number of, you've already heard from Professor Setis, you know, there is a number of categorizations uh, already at play in terms of which collection do they belong to, which is its own history, um, and the provenance of the objects, and also, of course, how they should group together. And then uh, from our position in a very sort of narrow-minded way, which was <clears throat> um, how to deal with an object which was um, on a base or how to deal with an object which was a head or et cetera, et cetera, and how to reconcile the 
different typologies. Next, please. Next, please. Yeah. Um, so very briefly, uh, we can see here, there's Michelangelo's Capitoline Hill, the, the, the square, the wonderful uh, space of Michelangelo. And to the right-hand side uh, is the, where the Villa Caffarelli is. This is the Nolly plan. Uh, many of you will know this. Every architect's favorite plan um, showing the equivalence of built buildings and space. Um, next, please. And here's the Temple of Jove, uh, huge and massive complex. And, and the foundations are still there. Next, please. And uh, in many places are visible. And in the capital line, you said you, if you've been there, you, 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 you're very aware of uh, the dimension of, of this extraordinary um, uh, temple and how much of it is still there underground. And this section shows uh, Villa Caporelli uh, and a cut, and you can see what is uh, under our feet, literally. Um, when, we, uh, when we decided to, uh, when we started on the project, we were very keen that there should be some um, uh, understanding of what happened, uh, what was under the floors, but that became actually very difficult to, to realize. So that didn't become part of the experiential uh, part of the tour. This is a plan of the villa and the room sequence. And you can see that it's a series of small rooms. And you, if you remember from the images I showed you, I mean, those rooms have lost their character in terms of their historic uh, architecture. I mean, in a sense, this, uh, what is left is floating between the foundations of the temple and the, uh, the, the, the villa itself, which has been stripped of its decoration and to some degree its meaning. Next. Um, this, this is what's, these are the um, stones of the, of the foundations, the foundation walls of the temple. And we were very impressed with these, this, structures and the the quality of this these stone and brick uh, pieces and stone pieces and this this went into our our mind in some way and will you will you will see that uh, you've seen that it reappears in in terms of uh, an inspiration next please um the other inspiration is the tradition of displaying objects. Um, obviously, uh, archaeology and uh, other um, uh, objects need to be displayed differently than, you know, if one is working in a conventional museum of, of paintings and etc. But, uh, and Italy has this extraordinary um, post-war tradition of of um, uh, allestimento by exhibition design by significant architects, the most significant architects. Um, obviously, there was a <clears throat> um, you know there's a surfeit of, of patrimony in in uh, in Italy, and uh, after the war, there was uh, fascinating and in some ways, I, I think some of the best uh, exhibition design was undertaken by, uh, this is uh, BPPR in uh, Castle Suazesco in Milan, next. Uh, uh, this is, uh, I think this is Franco Albini in, in Genoa. Yeah, it's Albini in Genoa. Uh, also, this is Albini, I think. And this is uh, Carlo Scarpa, who's probably the most famous uh, of them. But again, you can see this idea of dialoguing uh, between objects and space and the dialogue between the objects themselves. Um, uh, this was a fantastic moment in, in uh, architecture and design generally in Italy. It was a, really a, 
a, a great moment in, in, in design generally, and that also included exhibition design and installation where clearly the, the designers were familiar and enjoyed a sort of playfulness with the objects themselves. So this was another, in a way, reference to us. Just now, just explaining then our, our process, um, we were very, in, in some ways, we wanted to avoid installation. We were trying to think about how could we um, permeate these objects uh, and make, present them in a way that you didn't really uh, notice the, the way they were presented, but obviously you were, you were impressed by them. And one can't help you fail, fail to be impressed by them. They are the most extraordinary uh, objects. Uh, uh, when you, if you have opportunity to see, I really encourage you. It's, it's a fantastic collection of pieces. So we try to, as a way, in a way, disappear the uh, exhibition installation. We had, to, we had to make a floor. And then we decided that we would try to think about uh, how that floor could be uh, become a sort of topography uh, of the the villa. And and by the way, I, I haven't said it explicitly, but I've sort of hinted at it that the 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 interior of the villa has has very little character. And I would say, in some ways, the 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 work that's being done in terms of lighting and those things. That, uh, are not, not, not things which you really can, can, we could really enjoy or benefit. So we, we nearly sort of created rooms within the rooms. And therefore the floor was the most important thing. And then we thought about the walls. So we've created these space, spaces inside the spaces. And then Salvatore says, um, the, the two elements in a way were them, was the floor, which then molded into plinths and blocks and the walls, which, uh, were painted to reflect, uh, uh, to recall the setting of the collection in in the, in the museum, Tolonia. Um, Next, please. And of course, we have objects which I mean, we have a lot of objects, ninety-two objects, which is quite a lot to put in there. Some pieces you must see in the round. It, was, it would be a, a crime not to. Other other pieces it's possible to see them um, uh, from one side. And other pieces need to benefit from being put together. Obviously bus, uh, in a way, enjoy that. They become nearly like uh, a sort of, yeah, a, a people, you know, they nearly become like uh, inhabitants of the rooms. This shows you the sequence that we then also had to carve out of the, the villa. So it's a sort of artificial reconstruction not only of the rooms, but also of the sequence that allows you to follow the, the route that uh, Salvatore and Carlo were keen to, to uh, establish. Next. And then we, in this sort of um, approach, the strategy of rooms inside rooms, we um, spend a lot of time trying to think about how we can make, as it were, the architecture of each room in sympathy with the objects that Salvatore wanted to put in each room and trying to reduce the, the appearance of the um, settings, the things that these things need to sit on, their, their topography in a way, be as natural and as um, relaxed and as, as simple as possible. So we try to group things. We try to make this uh, construction of, of, of steps and blocks uh, really, minimal and, and and disappear. Next, please. And then if you build that up, this is a sequence of models that show the relationship between the, the rooms in the rooms created by the floors, then the blocks, uh, the, the objects in the round, the walls against which objects are seen, the flat object or the, the objects which are presented in a more flat way, and then the sequence itself. Next, please. And uh, why am I showing this? Go to the next one. Oh yeah, okay. So, sorry, go back one. Um, just to go on about the color and setting of obviously these, um, these objects which have been restored beautifully and cleaned with so much care. Um, 
have a strong uh, silhouette uh, potential. And so, you know, they're always, they were always photographed in stark backgrounds and therefore that was clearly something that inspired Salvatore and us in terms of the way these objects could be presented against uh, a darker background and against a darker floor so that they become luminous in their context. So we did a lot of testing uh, of objects. Uh, there were, uh, I can assure you, there were very many iterations of this sequence until Salvatore was totally happy with what went with what, uh, and we were happy with uh, how we might be able to um, create the landscape. And also, I have to say, we had substantial issues about floor loadings, which are which were not actually sufficient, probably for. Uh, from, I mean, many of our designs were, we couldn't do because of the um, poor construction of the floors. And this shows it. So this is the process we went through in terms of presenting uh, alternative, alternative uh, layouts and ideas to Salvatore and uh, keep going. And then the reality itself, which is, um, you know, I mean, you won't, you won't notice what we did quite rightly because the, the objects are just spectacular. But you can see here, so you go back, uh, um, there is a slightly, uh, there is a bit of an architectural battle going on. You can see the background uh, architecture, which we were not particularly happy with. And in, in a way, we tried to disappear that even more than, than ours, creating this uh, framed setting and getting rid of the, the noise of the, the uh, original rooms. Next. And of course, the sequence is important. The, 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 the sequence of the objects in, in the room and the sequence of the objects towards the next room, the whole enfilade idea and the, and the orientation that you would get. And the, and the pace and the rhythm and, and trying to use um, certain rooms, certain spaces and objects uh, to emphasize that rhythm. Um, and just on that last one, sorry, can you go back? Um, you can just see on the on the front of this plinth, there's a small black plaque, and this is the uh, signage. Um, we worked, uh, well, we worked, we worked for Electra, um, who did a spectacular catalog, which I absolutely implore you to get hold of. It's, it's a really beautiful catalog, but more than that, um, you know, they were uh, the main sponsors of the exhibition and they were really uh, important partners in this whole thing. And the graphics uh, we organized together and we didn't want, I mean, you can see <clears throat> these objects speak for themselves and, and Salvatore also agreed that, you know, the, the, the information would be uh, in uh, a, a small catalog you carry around with you, a small paper you carry around with you, and then very minimally noted uh, on each object. Next. Next. So, I mean, I'm just repeating the, the, these beautiful objects. I mean, uh, all we have done is created a, a setting for, for them. Next. And uh, some spectacular uh, rooms and, and wonderful pieces. The, the goat that Salvatore mentioned, I'm gonna just say one more word, I think at the end about that, but keep going. I think we're showing, this is, yeah, just to, And just another thing, I mean, I would say the lighting, you know, lighting is always under, underestimated. This is not a great photograph, I only put it in because it's, taken by the lighting consultant. Um, Mario Nani, uh, who's a, a, lighting a, a genius lighting consultant we work with a lot. Um, he's, he's really a, a, a maestro, but he not only worked with us, he gave the lights here. I mean, he, he became a major uh, sponsor of the exhibition, uh, not only through material, but his, his time. And the lighting is really, uh, beautifully done and really careful to, to, to create the, the, to confirm all of the decisions that all of us were making. And finally, uh, I leave with a goat, which I think is, is <clears throat> an obvious favorite for many of us. I mean, there are plenty of others, um, uh, 
but as Sarah Torres said, I mean, there's a number of things about this collection which are unique and in a way quite strange for us to come to terms with. Um, uh, and, and one is, of course, the, 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 the regaining of, uh, of, a, of another history and uh, elevating these objects uh, once again in a new context. Um, of, of copying and repeating them. And also in terms of repairing, um, we, we have a sort of, uh, sort of Ruskinian uh, heritage that, uh, and, and I do a lot of work with, my office does a lot of work with you know, ar architectural restorations. And the, the morality is always that um, you are not the artist, you're, you're trying to, as it were, um, protect the work that has come before and the work of the architect that has has done it. Uh, you are you are there, as it were, to to be the guardian of that. And of course, in in doing that, you do have to make a lot of decisions. But you certainly don't you don't try to intellectually you don't try to imitate what's been lost. You try to to soften damage. Um, this is a completely, not only do you try to imitate, you try and do better. Um, the artists of the Renaissance believed that they were in a sort of uh, skillful and intellectual competition with uh, the, the artists that they admired so much. And this is a really fascinating uh, twist, I think, on uh, creative continuity and, and, and something maybe, I don't know whether it teaches us something or not, but certainly um, uh, I've always been an advocate in architecture. I've just restored the Mies van der Rohe National Gallery in, in Berlin. There's no way I would compete with Mies van der Rohe for obvious reasons. I mean, uh, um, but uh, it's quite, in, I find this fascinating that uh, an artist of, of this period would, would see this not not just as a as a responsibility to, to to repair but actually something which is a sort of challenge so i just as a, an aside I've, I've that's apart from this being a most wonderful goat uh, that's my last slide david thank you so much really wonderful to get your perspective on the whole history of your approach. Um, maybe I will add a spotlight for Salvatore and for David and for me, so we can all focus on each other for a few minutes. I have a million questions. I'm sure others will have lots of questions too, so I promise not to take up too much of our time. Um, I wanted to just start, I suppose, by following up a number of the ways uh, you two described the approach that you took with this exhibition. Uh, as Salvatore rightly says, there could have been many different exhibitions with the same material, uh, many different threads uh, through it. I think one of the uh, interesting choices here is precisely to use the history of collecting as, the, as what Salvatore described as the red thread uh, through this, this collection and this exhibition. And I'm curious to two things. One is about what you learned from this uh, approach, uh, whether there were surprises or, uh, you know, was it something that you already knew what you wanted to say about the history of collecting or did you make discoveries yourselves? And I suppose second, given that David has uh, focused so much on the history of the site and on the uh, received histories of the actors, as you put it, and Salvatore, given that you yourself are so sensitive to archeology, span and to the history of context for these objects, was there any tension in choosing one moment of display, if you, if you like, one style of display? And as you go back in time, not choosing not to put it in a villa setting or in a, in a Renaissance setting or in the ground, or you know, in a way you choose one moment of display uh, within which to show the history of display. 
So do those two questions make any sense? And uh, if so, uh, what, what do you think? They sure do. Uh, should I respond first? Yes, yeah, sure. Okay, so uh, uh, um, uh, to the, your first question, I, I'd like to say first that the reason why uh, I very much wanted to select as a possible uh, thread through uh, the um, uh, exhibition to put together the uh, uh, sculptures through a, a narrative. I thought that uh, focusing on the early history, of collecting, on the history of collecting and on the transition from private collecting to, to public collectors, which is something that on the Capitol Museums could be done very uh, uniquely. I think that this, uh, uh, the, the, the main reason I, I, I wanted to choose this, uh, um, uh, this topic is that I thought it was the most, the most powerful possible idea in order to achieve what this exhibition should achieve, making the knowledge of the importance of the of the Tolonia uh, collection so clearly and permanently on view that uh, the project of reopening the museum is irreversible. I, uh, uh, the, the, the only thing to avoid is that we had the Tolonia Museum. Now we have this exhibition and tomorrow there is nothing else. Uh, 92 statues are on show and the rest will... will. Now, uh, I should add that uh, the, the, the restoration of, the, of, of other sculptures is going on and that, 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 that Bulgaria is the main sponsor for restoration, that Fondazione Tolonia is very active and that also the Ministry of Culture and Minister Franceschini personally are very engaged in the idea of creating the museum. Electa is working very very much on it. So I, I think that uh, the, what we learned, we learned a, a, a number of things. We wanted, in, in order to, uh, to, to put the, 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 the pieces, the sculptures in, uh, in this uh, um, framework, uh, history of collecting. It was very important for us to understand, to make uh, uh, archival research. And in some cases, uh, the, uh, in, in, in some cases, there are things we also learned after the exhibition. For instance, the Hercules uh, made uh, uh, of 112 uh, pieces, which we called uh, in, in the exhibition the uh, Hercule Frankenstein, <laughs> because it is made of different little pieces. Now, we didn't know where it came from, and after uh, the uh, the uh, exhibition it, itself in, in a talk like this organized by in Rome by the Academia dei Lincei, Maria Grazia Picozzi, a very good archaeologist uh, who is professor in Rome, she discovered uh, actually that this piece most probably came from the Justiniani collection, which we uh, we didn't know for sure. So uh, just to mention one uh, thing, the, on on your second on your second question, the inspiration of the site. There was an inspiration of the site, and this is something that David uh, thought about so beautifully that I will not try to uh, compete with him. But there was also a challenge uh, coming from the site, or, or, or I should say perhaps two challenges, two different challenges. First, how to deal with the space and how to um, uh, preserve some memory of the uh, temple, of, the, of the, the invisible temple, which is visible next room, but is, is invisible in the, in the rooms of the exhibition while making the, 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 the space appropriate for the exhibition itself. And here is when, when, uh, when, uh, when uh, um, David's uh, incredible, uh, uh, ability in uh, uh, in mastering a, a problem like this came in. And so he basically uh, made uh, rooms within rooms. It, it, it's like as if a spaceship would uh, uh, be <laughs> descending from uh, the sky into the Villa Caffarelli and creating a different and dedicated space, which we didn't have. And the second, the, the second challenge was about how to deal uh, uh, how 
we have a, a slight freeze. Hopefully he will come back soon. Does it work? Uh, now you're back. Yes, it froze. So your second challenge got cut off. So if you can repeat. Oh, Sorry, ma have... the, the, the difference is that uh, in, in, in this case, Mm. No, maybe we were very lucky so far, very little internet problem. Um, David, maybe if you can unmute and jump in, I can signal to Salvatore. Um, yeah. Maybe pick, pick up with the spaceship. Remind me the remind well, me the, the key the key question, and I guess it is as much for you uh, as as for Salvatore, is that given how attentive you were in your preparation to the history of spaces, whoop, we lost. Maybe he comes back. Uh, I hope so. Given given your your sensitivity to the history of spaces that uh, the collection occupied, and indeed the history of sites that you were working on, um, it was interesting in a way that only one uh, presentation style was chosen. And so I was curious, I agree with you that there are uh, extraordinary examples of Italian design in museums uh, with collections in the, particularly the post-war in, in the 20th century. But I'm just curious if there were decisions made or discussions about, let's say, showing more, you could have projected or put, you know, uh, photography on the backdrop to show how it was displayed in previous incarnations or in previous sites. And I just wonder if that was ever part of the discussion. No. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, there's nothing more powerful than objects. And if you have powerful objects, there's nothing more powerful than powerful objects. Yeah. Um, and they talk across time. And they talk across history. They talk across ideas of old and new. Um, and uh, even those of us that uh, know so little about these things cannot help but be uh, enthralled by the um, the, 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 the achievement <clears throat> uh, that these objects contain and the creativity that they contain. And I think <clears throat> this is something which I think is interesting about oh, relationship is, is really fascinating. It's something I have to deal. Am I freezing as well? No. You, you did for a second, but you're back. Okay. There. Um, you know, as, as a modern architect, we, we've, I've grown up <clears throat> with the idea of the modern movement, and the modern movement was very disinterested in the past. On, on, on the contrary, it took a radical attitude towards a sort of 20th century tabula rasa. Um, uh, luckily, we've, we've rethought that. I mean, it was an exciting moment if you were in it. <clears throat> um, but uh, I think that in architecture, we've, we have a slightly difficult understanding about what we should keep and what we should, you know, how do we innovate? Um, in literature, there's no confusion. You don't have to um, uh, destroy the work of Joyce uh, in order to write another book or in, also in, in painting and, and the problem in architecture often we have to knock things down to build new things. So <clears throat> we end up with a, with a very, um, conflated and compromised attitude towards history. And I think it's just, it's really interesting to see objects like this, not only speak across time, but actually that it include um, different moments. So the, the original objects, the, 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 the modifications and restorations, the collections, 
the, <coughs> the, the, the represent presentation of them now. They are these inanimate objects <coughs> which manage to talk about history in a way that we can't. And we are, we are dangerously enthralled sometimes by our interpretations of the past. There is no truth about past. I mean, it's, everything is a story. So <coughs> the nice thing about objects is that they, 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 don't, they don't come with a sort of interpretation. They, they, are, they are them. Um, and, you know, those of us that have suffered Brexit <coughs> know that we are victims mm -hmm. of a, a narrative and an idea of the past, <coughs> which is, um, uh, well, I don't, I don't want to go much further, but <coughs> yeah. art, the, the work of artists, the work of writers, the work of poets, the work of sculptors, you know, they managed to negotiate between, uh, you know, without talking about truth, they find truths. And, and you know, they, they manage, these objects manage to do the things that are very difficult to do in other ways. And I, I, that's what I find so fascinating about, or, you know, and, and it was a privilege to, to be so close to these objects when, when one isn't normally got that, that proximity. Uh, absolutely. And welcome back, Salvatore. Um, we yes, sorry. No, oh, don't worry, don't worry, no problem. And I, I actually, David, what you just said is the perfect segue back to what Salvatore described as the other possible thread for a different exhibition, which was precisely the restoration, which features so prominently in this collection, uh, in many ways in all collections, but this seems like an exemplary case of the history of, uh, of restoration of, of pieces being put together into one piece of different moments of the past, different tastes, different technologies about providing a complete or completed past. And Salvatore, this is something you yourself have worked on and written about so beautifully. Um, I wonder if you could draw out maybe for us some of the, the thoughts and also um, whether you had another layer of work with with restoration and conser conservation now. Um, it sounds like there was new scientific research and new work done on the objects. So uh, I'm very, uh, you know, very, very impressed by how, how, how beautifully the history of the object comes through uh, in these uh, restored uh, objects. Well, uh, uh, but let me put it this way. Each individual object, as I guess David was uh, was saying, because I I've I've, I've only uh, be able to hear the last few words by him. Uh, each individual object in this collection, as in, in every other collection or museum, each individual object has its own biography, its own life. And life is made uh, is is also uh, uh, a stratification of moments. So what is interesting in the in the in the history of restoration of the pieces in such a, an incredible um, uh, collection like the Torlonia one, you can see you can uh, you can reconstruct. Uh -oh. <laughs> it is not easy, but a given piece has been we would never use today. Re re restored in in a, in a 15th century, and then uh, again in in, uh, in, uh, in 17th century, and then again in 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 19th century, and so forth and so on. The uh, case of the goat that uh, that uh, uh, the David described is uh, is particularly interesting. Uh, the, 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 in the same room, this is something I didn't mention. There is also another statue restored by uh, one of the two crouching. Venuses as a head uh, made by Pietro Bernini, the, 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 the father of Gian Lorenzo Bernini. So in, in both cases, what uh, in order to understand why they did it, we should uh, uh, think about what the, the French called, used to call la querelle des anciens des modernes, uh, i.e. the way of, of, of competing, the restorer should compete with the ancient sculpture. Uh, 
And Bernini, uh, Gian Lorenzo Bernini certainly succeeded in having a head much better than the body of that particular god. <laughs> so I think it was, uh, looking at things in this way, in this particular case, not in every possible case, not certainly in the Frankenstein Hercules, but, uh, um, but I think that uh, different angles could be, it could be uh, chosen and it, it could be possible to visit the exhibition or to rearrange the exhibition, which is very difficult because they, uh, each statue is uh, weighs tons, so it's impossible to move them, but uh, it, it would be possible to rearrange them according to a history restoration as well. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, it reminds me, especially when you refer to the Crouching Venus with these, these two very similar uh, figures and when you referred to copies and to serial, of course, if, the, if you haven't seen this, everybody, uh, this is one of Salvatore's uh, recent uh, 2015 exhibition called Serial Portable Classic. And for me, it was such an extraordinary eye opener, again, very beautifully and, and uh, uh, unusually staged and presented in Fondazione Prada. Um, I wonder, Salvatore, if you want to say a little bit more in this case about how one collection can give you these serial, these insights into serial production, and in particular, the jump from Greece to Rome, because again, you referred to a, a number of uh, objects which take us from, from Athens to Rome. And I'm just curious, uh, again, what uh, your previous project would have done with this project. So thank you very much, Bill, for mentioning the uh, serial uh, uh, and portable classic exhibition, the Fondazione Prada in Milan and Venice. Actually, I uh, wanted to quote uh, this, the, my, my previous uh, uh, exhibition. And this is the reason why I've chosen two types, the uh, Prax Italian satire um, uh, and uh, Anna Pawomenos uh, and, and uh, the, the Crouching Venus, they were both represented in, uh, in the Fondazione Prada in, in Milan by different status, totally different status. So by, by choosing these two and by choosing to show the seriality uh, also in the, in the, uh, in the Tolonia exhibition, I wanted to show indirectly more for the, ex for the more experts like yourself who uh, clearly noticed it, but also for uh, 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 a, a, at least a part of the general public, how rich the Tolonia Museum collection is, because you can also arrange a, 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 a complex concept like that of seriality of classical art in, uh, uh, by, 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 uh, by looking just to this collection. And, and, and let me mention also another point for the, for the Prada exhibition in Milan, we had uh, uh, more or less the same number of objects coming from 40 different museums around the world. Now, in this case, we only have one big loan from the Tolonia Museum. So this is the dream of every curator <laughs> to have only one, one big loan. So, but uh, again, my main, uh, um, main idea I have in mind, which is almost an obsession of mine over the last few years, is to make the, uh, the, 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 um, uh, the, 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 the richness and the importance of, of the Tolonia, of the Tolonia uh, Museum clear and evident to everybody so as to make the, 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 the project for reopening of the museum something that uh, cannot be, uh, cannot, be um, cannot be missed. That's not something for me to do. I'm too old for this. But for the next generation, I hope that the next generation will be able to see the Tolonia Museum in its entirety as it deserves to be. Uh, that's fantastic. I think you're right in some sense that this was the dream loan because it's one institution. On the other hand, given how complex this institution is and yeah. how its history has been so vexed between family foundation, national ministry, the law courts, et cetera, I don't think, I think you undersell how difficult the uh, right. negotiations were. Um, course, I, know, I know they weren't this easy. I know they weren't this easy. This was less a joke. Yeah, well, yes and no. Um, David, just uh, come back to you for a minute. And, and this is really one, uh, one final question from me for now. 
um, before we ask other people uh, about what they want to know about. I am very happy that you brought the light uh, lighting design in at the very end of, of your presentation because I, I was very struck, maybe what the, the most uh, eye-opening exhibition I ever saw was uh, on Andros, the island of Andros in Greece. There was an exhibition of Henry Moore sculptures and it was called Henry Moore in the Light of Greece. And it was his relationship to Greek sculpture, which was very, very negative for a very long time. And then he explained that it was seeing his own sculpture literally in Greek light when he realized that there was a new relationship and a long relationship. And then of course he becomes extremely referential to Greek, uh, ancient Greek sculpture. Um, and in this case, I, I wondered if you had, um, had thought much, or of course you have, but, but how, how you thought about the material, because marble, uh, it's not displaying uh, bronze, which you have at the beginning, it's not uh, painting. Marble is quite extraordinary uh, in the way, of course, it catches light and reflects light. And so I'm curious uh, how, how the approach to the material of marble, in this case, uh, influenced the design and in particular how the lighting uh, tried to work with that. I think you may have to unmute again. Yes. Um, well, lighting objects is much more satisfying than lighting paintings. Um, because uh, they are in the round and they have they have depth and relief, so you will get immediate reward from lighting. Lighting paintings, you, you don't want to know about. You know, you you. It's somehow not the only way to light a painting is in a way that you don't know that you've lit it, and that's not so easy because <clears throat> it's a flat surface and often it has a reflective. Uh, service in front of it. So I don't want to be glib, but lighting sculptures is a hell of a lot easy. You know, it's lighting white ones, easy. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, they're all the same color and, and they, they bounce light around. So they're, they're not acting up in, in complex ways. So no, I mean, <clears throat> everything you did to these sculptures just pays you back immediately. You put them in front of a color and they shine. You put some light on them, they shine. Um, you know, it's a, it's a walk in the park in terms of uh, display. <laughs> Sorry, I, sh I should make it sound much more complicated than that we, <laughs> we really had a bad time. And, but, yeah, it was um, such a struggle, such a struggle. Uh, but no, not I mean, not I, I should say at this point, um, you know, my, my team did most of this work, and that's Giuseppe Zampieri, who runs our office in Milan, and Cristiano Billy, who, who was the project architect. I mean, they, they, uh, they did the hard work. <clears throat> I just came in and had some nice conversations with Salvatore. Um, I mean, but we, although I did have quite a few meetings in Rome with complex um, political situations when we were um, you know, in the early part of the project. But no, I mean, it was <clears throat> really a work done by my, my studio in Milan. And um, it was, uh, from a, from a um, technical point of view, it was very easy. And to work with Mario Nani was also a great. Um, yes. Well, well please, please give our congratulations to them as well. Um, really extraordinary. Um, I'm aware that we've only got 15 minutes left and I haven't allowed yet any time for the, the uh, members of our audience to ask. So please do uh, raise your hand uh, in the virtual way because I can't see very many of you. So if you have a question, please either type it in the chat, uh, which is easy way to do it and I will read it out loud or say that you have a question and I will uh, call on you and you can unmute. Uh, or uh, if you want, under the reactions button at the bottom of the Zoom screen, you should be able to click the raise hand and then I will be uh, made aware that you uh, would like to ask a question. So um, please do feel free to ask any, any of your questions uh, that you may have. As uh, you're finding your way to the chat box or to the raise hand function, I will actually just uh, take the opportunity to ask uh, Salvatore in particular, but uh, maybe for both of you, what, what can you say a little bit more about the plans 
for the future of this collection and its display. I very much hope like you that there will be a, again a proper uh, Museo Torleone, uh, that, that, that the, that the um, Torleonian Museum will be revived. But uh, what's, what's the plan? <laughs> Well, le let me let me tell you where we are. Uh, mm, first of all, the Ministry of Culture, the Italian Ministry of Culture and the Fondazione Torlonia, they co-signed an agreement. So the agreement in in the, uh, the in this agreement, it is explicitly said that uh, the um, uh, this exhibition is the first step towards the reopening of the museum. Second. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the agreement, uh, according to the agreement, the property of the sculptures will stay with the family Torlonia and, uh, and will be managed as it is now by the, fund, uh, by the Torlonia Foundation. Third, the ministry uh, will uh, uh, help the Torlonia Foundation finding a new building where to put the, uh, the collection, which is not very easy. Uh, Rome is full. of wonderful building of this size, a particular a, a, a building of particular size. So, but uh, the, the ministry identified a wonderful building and the, the minister said it at the, at the inauguration of the exhibition. Uh, and this is Villa uh, Silvestri Rivaldi, uh, the villa of a cardinal, of a, a 16th century cardinal, very close to the Colosseo, very close to the Colosseo. So in a, in a, in a, in a wonderful location and which is not in very good state, but they are restoring already. And the ministry uh, put or, already 40 uh, million uh, euro uh, for, this, for this project. Well, this is what I know. Uh, I, I, I also know that I don't want to work on the, on the, on the, on the museum because this is a, a project for too many years and I'm too old for that. But I, I really hope that uh, uh, this uh, agreement will be seriously put in place and that either in that particular building or in another building that's not, uh, that's not for me to decide that this project will, 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 uh, will move forward over the next few years. Okay, that's, that's really helpful. And again, it makes more sense of the way in which you saw the exhibition in part as providing the uh, the, the impetus so that this will be an irreversible process. I think this is a very strong argument and I very much hope it happens. Okay, now I have uh, four questions coming in. So suddenly here we go. So Max uh, Prav asks David something quite interesting. And for a Barbican resident like me, I love this question. Um, they, he asks, he says, you say that the brick masonry uh, being an organizing element for the exhibition. Can you talk a little bit more about the measure or scale, or I would say also tonality uh, chosen for the bricks? Well, I think, I mean, you've, you've, you're implying the answer in the question in a way. I mean, bricks have this wonderful um, quality of, of scale. They are they are hand sized because they are managed and you can pick them up with your hand. <clears throat> so, um, and they have a materiality. And uh, I suppose in this context, let me start again. I would have loved if the villa had had a strong architectural presence itself that we could have borrowed. There's nothing better than <clears throat> the building having its, its qualities, uh, even if some of them have been a bit eroded and that, but then it's finding those qualities and, and pulling them out and enjoying them and complimenting, playing with them. Um, without being too brutal, th this building doesn't have any internal qualities <laughs> left. Um, and the, 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 the renovation that's been done to it, which was, you know, logistic and practical, putting lighting in and doing that. Um, similarly, um, is I would say without charm. So we found ourselves in a way having to create a new architecture, which is not the place I would have wanted to start. I would have much preferred not to have to um, 
uh, create an architectural landscape. I would have preferred to have created a, um, an installation bouncing off of the, the building that was there. But <clears throat> we decided early on that, that we needed to create, uh, in a way compensate for the lack of substance that these spaces uh, gave. And, and that's why I think instead of having conventional exhibition materials, which um, might have been a bit more practical and, <clears throat> and easier to organize, uh, I think we, we sort of headed for something that looked like it might last for you know, a few hundred years instead of something which can be easily dismantled. And so, yes, the brick gives you that sense of solidity, it gives you a sense of scale, it gives you a sense of texture that in a way compensates for the, the loss of architecture that the villa has.